sort of a presentation today from our freshman year learning community. I just want to give a little recognition, or some recognition rather, to Dr. Arthur Kelly, uh, Mari, I can't say this, Betensky? Huh? Mary, Mary. Bedensky. Hi. Am I just, am I just murdering? Mary B, what up, girl? Okay. And Stephanie Mathis, who are the uh, people who have led these young people uh, in this presentation today. I'm going to read this um, introduction just as it was given to me. I am introducing the fine, foxy freshman of Religion 160, the freshman year learning community uh, on faith, justice, and Portland advocating for social change. When I say your name, raise your hand. Trent, Kiki, Riley, Robert, Justin, Oksana, Selena, Jose, Taylor, Bailey, Shannon, Brendan, Skyler, Miranda, and Lynette. They're in class. They're in class? What? PCC. Oh, who have P class at PCC. Ben and Rochelle serve as peer mentors. Will you give them a hand before they even get one? <laughs> These students... These students have been journeying through the story of self, the story of God's heart for justice and the oppressed, and the story of our city through the lens of child sex trafficking. They've met with Commissioner Fritz, experts, survivors, police, advocates, engaged with news articles and videos. Basically, they know what they're talking about today. They have excelled in meeting the challenge to learn, listen, love, and live out a life of justice, Shalom, advocacy, and hope. Today, they are creatively sharing with you the issue of child sex trafficking in Portland from their own thoughts and their artistic reflections. This is their original work. Amen. They will invite you to join them in advocating for those who are vulnerable and suffering at the end of their program. These students are remarkable. They are brave, and they are going to change the world and they are deserving of your attention, undivided today. So if you would please close your laptops, hide your phones, even from yourself. Let nothing distract you from what your peers have to say today. Please welcome FYLC. Child sex trafficking. Sex trafficking involves individuals profiting from sexual exploitation of others. Portland is the hub for sex trafficking. Portland has more strip clubs per capita than Las Vegas. The average age for a girl that enters sex trafficking is 12 to 14 years, while the average age of a transgender is 11 to 13. Runaway teens will be approached by a pimp within the 48 hours on the streets. Average girl can be forced to have sex up to 20 to 48 times a day. Sex trafficking generates 32 billion year yearly in the United States. A pimp can make up to 150,000 to 200,000 per child each year. So for our FYLC, we had to research articles based on sex trafficking. And we had, um, like Michelle said, we had um, personal speakers come and tell their story to us. Um, and one of them, she had a very hard life. And I wrote this story um, based on what she told us of her life. He promised a sweet escape a place where there were no rules, no restrictions, a place where she could be her own person and not have to worry about being told no. The deal was that she would go with him and gain all she ever desired in exchange for one simple job. She was skeptical at first, the thought of, it's too good to be true, reminded her that fairy tales don't exist. She may be a Cinderella, but she had no fairy godmother. But then he showed her his world. He treated her to dinners, and gifted her with expensive trinkets. He loved her, and so she sat and pondered. 
If I can have all this, she thought one night, then maybe doing that wouldn't be too bad. And so she accepted his bargain. She would give herself to him fully, and in exchange, he would love and care for her always. She didn't realize her folly, didn't know just what it was she had given away, and for a long time, she never did realize it. The first job went on without a hitch. It was even mildly pleasurable. The man was older and clean, and kind and clean-shaven and well-dressed. He was gentle in his handlings. They were in a five-star hotel. When he was done and left, her love praised her work doing so well. She positively glowed with his appraisal. The next few jobs were slightly less pleasurable. Always older men, but never as kind as the first. And then, and then a job came that she refused to do. Three men at once? Never. And then he hit her. The first slap left her stumbling back in shock and clutching her reddening cheek. The second had her gasping in pain. The third had her head reeling and teeth throbbing. She did the job. After that, everything began to spiral out of control. His moods shifted. He became angry and difficult to be around and yell yelling and hitting her one moment, then whispering, caring words, and hugging and loving her the next. He confused her, and she didn't let her mind focus too long on it. The jobs became progressively worse. The men older and older and dirtier and dirtier, the rooms were nothing but small, ugly hotel, motel rooms. She didn't understand the pain consuming every fiber of her being. Then she found a way to make the pain go away. It was gross and bruised the inside of her arms, but it numbed her in such a way that she can finally do what she was told without too many tears being sh shed. This continued on for a long, long time. Men came and went, bruises formed and healed, the ache was glossed over and made bearable. And then she was so very sick. Her stomach ached with an illness she could not name, and the mornings had her crouched over the toilet and, toilet and heaving. Months passed, and her stomach began to protrude and harden, and realization settled in. A few months later, he was just a little too angry, and she was just a little too vulnerable. She bled a lot that night. Once more, the years passed, and what happened before began once again. But this time, she would not make the same mistake. She left with just a handful of money and the clothes on her back, scared for weeks that she would be found. The trip back home was long. When has she moved so far away? When she finally saw her mother, there was a tense silence between them. By then, her stomach was large and swollen. They collapsed into each other's arms and cried for a long while. She promised her mother to go to that special clinic after the baby was born. And when the small, fragile baby was finally in her arms, she resolved to make it so her life was better to make sure her daughter would be loved and cared for and not fall into the wrong hands. The clinic took months. The rooms were bleak, but the people were kind. It helped, and she finally got her chance and returned to her mother and daughter. She was clean and happy, and nothing could break her now perfect world. But then a call came, and the old fear began to rear its ugly disfigured head once again. She didn't back down this time, though. She didn't cower and hide. She stood her ground and called for help. The trial was horrible. She cried when the memories flooded her as she was up on the stand, but she did not. She but she did it, and she was and he was taken away. They promised he would never come near her or another another vulnerable little girl again. She realized then, as she held her daughter after her foolish acts as a child and the hectic events that followed closely after, that though this world is cruel, it was beautiful too. Thank you. Hello. So, as a part of our class and one of our one of our larger assignments that Selena mentioned, we were um, we we're looking at news articles about various issues, and um, we were allowed to write um, <coughs> um, reflection papers, and um, we were also given the option a couple of times to do uh, creative creative reflections, and so. 
I decided to I decided to write a song. The song is all about um, it fits it fits with everything today, and it's um, I was driving down 82nd Street, a street that we learned an awful lot about, and um, I was driving down it one day, and I kept passing the street signs that kept calling it the Avenue of Roses. And um, one day, one day, like in learning about all the things that we learned, the irony of that of that sign and that statement kind of hit me. And so I decided to write a song about it. How could you sleep if you knew she was out there, your daughter out working the streets? Oh, how could you eat when she's bringing home her money just for a chance not to be beat? Oh, why don't you see that she's not a criminal, a slave at the end of a leash? Hear the tears of these children cry as they shout to the Lord and they ask Him why He is not coming back for them. Another stranger, another passerby, she needs His help. She can't bear the thought of another night An avenue of roses But the garden's dead An avenue of roses But they've not been fed a new roses, but the God instead. Have a new roses, but they've not been fed. Oh, there will sing. Oh, there will sing. There will sing. There will sing. Can you hear the tears of? These children cry as they shout to the Lord and they ask Him why He is not coming back for them. Another stranger, another passerby, she needs His help, but she can't bear the thought of another night. Of the children cry, they shout to the Lord, and they ask Him why. But I know He's, yeah, He's coming back for them. Another stranger, she hopes, will pass her by. She needs His help. She can't bear the thought of another night. Konnichiwa, means hello. Um, I'm Robert, and I, uh, I decided to write this poem for uh, this whole, this whole uh, sex trafficking thing we've been doing. And I wrote it in the third person perspective of a victim of the sex trafficking. I named it Taken. You sit in your dark, unforgiving room, awaiting your uncertain and looming doom. You can't even see the sky's pale moon. Surely he, your captor, will return soon. Your captor. 
Cold, ruthless, and heartless. A wicked smile, his face is shrouded in the darkness. He cuts your bones, seemingly effortless, and you look confused, vulnerable, and helpless. They force you onto their ravenous buyers, revealed your captor is their steady supplier. Your body they eagerly seek to acquire, and you curse them, scream out, call them defiler. Years and years this nightmare goes on, your own self now numbs and gone. You can't remember your family, it's been so long. You can't even remember your own favorite song. Until one day you cease to be of use, after so many years of age and abuse. You hope that you've reached a relieving truce that will simply turn and set you loose. But as you so passionately feared, they raised their power and you swiftly disappear. Gone is the life that you held so dear. It seems that you've reached your final frontier. Worse yet, few do anything to stop it. Too many say, it's not our problem, just drop it. Cries go unheard as they deliver another hit, and still no one seems to care, not even one bit. But something can be done to stop this atrocity, if only we would lay down our own acute hypocrisy. We, would, we could make it different, make everyone see. Then maybe, with hope, we can stand up and set them all free. Thank you. On. Okay, then. it's okay for me to stand here, Michelle. Now, I'm going to take a little side note. I'm going to take this issue home like Kanye West did with Chris Martin. Okay? Now, my mother was a chef for, say, 11, 12 years, way before Skylar ever came into the picture and I guess made her life better, even though I never took her word for it. Okay? And I grew up with curries, pastas, enchiladas. I mean, our house had mo more culture than a petri dish. It was amazing. So I'm sure that I'm going to emphasize, or sorry, empathize with a lot of you when I say that college food is weird to put up with. Can, can I hear some noise for that? That is weird to get used to this environment, right? Food. It's, and I'm not, I'm not used to broccoli. I'm not used to peas. I like the red meat and the pies and the cakes. I'm, I'm an unhealthy eater. But to the point is that as college students, we all rely on food. Duh, as human beings, we rely on food. But the point being now is that as college students, we don't have Andrew Jackson falling out between our fingers, shoved in our pockets. Okay, we're not 50 cent. <laughs> we need affordable food or we're going to go into debt like the Greek economy did. And that's not good, okay? And I know as college students that we get desperate for food. We go to Taco Bell or Jack in the Crack or McDonald's because we're hungry and, you know, health um, health becomes second priority. So let me put it, and then every once in a while we go to strip clubs because strip clubs have five dollar cardboard steaks or recycled sandals or whatever else they feed you for pocket change basically. And re uh, on the surface, if you skim the top ever so slightly, yeah, this is great. I mean, it's cheap food. But you have to also think about what a strip club is exactly besides the sexual exploitation of women, unless you're at a male strip club. I haven't seen many in Portland, though. Now, when you think about it, pimps and pushers, they visit strip clubs to recruit there because women who are scantily clad, young, and know how to dance, know how to make themselves look appealing to a crowd, are perfect candidates for prostitution. And then there's also the issue that some of these strip clubs, I'm not going to say all, but some of these strip clubs are fronts for prostitution. As in, you have pimps working through them, running them, selling 18, 17, whatever year old women to older, dirty Johns that can't get sex any other way or have some horrible fetish that they're hiding from their wives at home. Who knows? I don't want to. Okay? But so I want you all to think that strip clubs are to be avoided, okay? And this is easy for me to say on an ethical level just because. My, as I've said, my mother had a very cultural background. I grew up just hating these environments. And I would never eat there because I think it's repulsive. And I'd probably chew my own fingers off before that. Point being that when you go to these strip clubs, what you're doing is you're degrading women. Because women are a community, men are a community, every person forms some kind of community. And when you disrespect one woman, you start to realize 
you're disrespecting all women. You're disrespecting mothers, aunts, girlfriends, nieces, nephews, best friends, girlfriends, ex-girlfriends, and wives. And that's not good. Now, can I hear some noise for that? Okay, I mean, and here, we're Warner Pacific Knights. We know what it means to respect women because these are our friends. I mean, Michelle's up here leading us every day, the chapel team. We know that you can't respect or disrespect excuse me, someone based on their gender. That's, that's silly. That's such a lack of logic. It's, it's not even funny. And so that's why I'm asking, uh, part of our job here at Warner Pacific, we cannot go to strip clubs no matter how cheap the food is. And it's not, I wouldn't even call it food. Okay, we, we just can't go to strip clubs, period, because in the end, when you disrespect a woman and that disrespect comes right back to you, as it probably will, man, that just starts some dangerous cycle, and then that's no good. So we just heard from Skylar a male perspective on the sexualization of our society and how it affects us as college students on this very campus. When some of you walked in, you received a mark on your hand. I would like all the men with a mark on their hand to please stand up. These men represent the one in five boys who have been sexually abused before the age of 18. Take a good look. These are your brothers, your friends, your roommates. You can sit down. Now I'd like all the women who received an X to stand up. These represent the one in three girls who have been sexually abused before the age of 18. Take a good look. These are your sisters, your friends, your roommates. You can sit down. So now we would like to bring in the female perspective on what sexualization does to us as women. We have another poem that was written by one of our very own students about her personal experience, and we would like to invite all of the women in the room to read it out loud with us. It's on the screen. Oh, and please stand with us. I wish my heart could tell everyone of the pain I've kept inside, the harsh reality of the memory that I hide. Taking on the world only pushed me away for what I dodged that night was far worse than I can portray. You can't understand it until you live in the moment yourself. A strong, dark man against my small cry for help. It was no longer a choice once I found myself in his arms. And it was only silent prayers that saved me from true harm. In serious desperation, I begged God to keep me pure. Stupid is how I saw myself for falling into the stranger's lure. Once he touched me, it was too late. There was no turning back. Only 16 and stripped of my innocence birthed a new way for how I would act. Hours and hours of hell, trying to beg him to let me go. I kindly smiled and laughed it off because it was the only way I could cope. Cope with the sin, the painful shame I felt, and in the dark night, not even my cousin came to help. Sadly, it didn't end that night, and a chain reaction began to occur. My no means nothing to guys, and again and again I was hurt. But through the pain I flourish, because I refuse to fall. For Christ alone determines what I will be called. He didn't name me abused or trashy, and he has never turned from me. He looks into my eyes and loves every inch that he sees. He gives each of us the greatest gift we could receive, unconditional love, even in our darkest realities. A deep sense of peace when the heart feels like it will start to break, and the pieces to mend us when our whole world starts to shake. Hello again. Um, a big part of our class, it's, it's even in the title, is that it's not just justice, but it's faith. It's biblical justice that we studied, not just the justice of the world or the justice of the city. And so I'd like to read from you now 
a little, a little excerpt from one of my interpretations of biblical justice. Biblical justice is God restoring all what is broken. People, relationships, communities, society, and even creation back to the wholeness of what it was originally intended. Biblical justice is a topic that was brought up to me in church groups and congregations and small groups and everything else. And it wasn't something that I really understood. I knew all of the basics of what, God, what God's justice was, his laws, his commandments, verses that gave us life directions like Matthew 25. The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Everything, we're, everything else that we're told, like loving thy neighbor. But learning more about God's justice, I've learned that it's so much deeper than that. That he is so much deeper than that. It taught me that God really doesn't leave anyone out. He will deliver us from oppression, just like he did with the Israelites when they were oppressed by the Egyptians. Learning about what justice means in a biblical worldview has been a very new and eye-opening experience for me. Learning that all justice comes from God is something that I, I just never thought about. I, something that I guess I should have known. I'm always challenged by the concept of living justly in the presence of God. Being a true servant of God and living out his justice by caring for those in need. It's something I just, I needed more of a fire in my heart to do. I'm, I'm, let, I'm sure many people can relate to this, but I'm, I'm plagued with a very basic human flaw. Now prepare, prepare for this one, it's pretty shocking. Laziness. I know, right? I just, nobody else suffers from that. I must be the only one. But there's always, there's always something else to do work to be done or just just things that I things that I th think I want to do more or things that I think are more important however God's justice is something that I can be excited about just like the Israelites in Egypt I've found myself in times of trouble sometimes long times and sometimes shorter but also like the Israelites I know that my times of trial and tribulation that in those times, if I call out to God for help, I will not be met with silence. The ideas of biblical justice are more than just ways to care for the oppressed and the hurt. They can be placed into every, every aspect of our lives. I can learn from the ways of Jesus, who not only spent time with the rich and the powerful and the influential, but the weak, the lame, the oppressed, the people that nobody else wanted to be around. If I were to adopt those ideals, the ideals of Jesus, and to not care about who's cool, or not to just see the poor and just weep and pray for them, but want to do something about it, to fight with love and compassion against those who are oppressive, I could live a much more fulfilling life in Christ. My friendships could be more fulfilling if I didn't care about Social statuses can make a real difference in the community around me if I had that fire inside of me. Thank you. So, uh, you heard earlier that, uh, that the past couple of years the city has become a, uh, a hub for the sex trade. And that has made Portland one of the largest cities to have human trafficking. And now when I hear about that, I can't help but be scared because I know that's not what Portland is. And this is coming from a guy who was born and raised here. I'm a true-blooded Portlander. So just like any typical Portlander, I know all the food spots. I know all the cool places to hang out. But I also have to conceive the notion that my 12 and 8-year-old sisters are at risk of being kidnapped and sold. That terrifies me. And it terrifies me for every other kid out in this community.
but Portland is beyond ordinary. We have this amazing ability to rally over just things we're passionate about. So if we can rally over something as simple as more bike paths, we can definitely rally over something like child sex slavery. And I believe down in my soul that we can change that trajectory of this community. And we can start in a couple different ways, just right now. One, on our campus. We need to change the dynamic of how we interact with each other. You know, it, it might be cool for some people to go, oh, that, that girl's got a big booty. But literally, there could be women literally a few feet away from us hearing that. That doesn't create a safe environment for them. And we have to respect our boundaries. No matter how loud or how quiet, no always means no. And then we can help out through charity. What we've decided to do is we're going to try to get donations together for the Janice Youth Program Athena House. It's the only house, it's the only shelter for people who have been victims for, of sex trafficking. And we have a, we're going to have a jar at the Tabor Grind until uh, the end of the term. And we want you to donate. Please, please donate. And thirdly, having a presence at City Hall on December 4th, at 9.30 a.m., there's going to be a budget proposal for more funding for sex trafficking programs, shelters, and prevention. Last, because last May, uh, they cut our funding. They cut it. And there was only one person who was willing to stand up against that, and that was City Commissioner Amanda Fritz. So for the past couple months, she's been trying to sway the other commissioners' votes, but right now, she needs our support. She needs us to rally at City Hall, fill up that hearing room, and let them know that we care about this community and that we don't want this thing to happen anymore. And if you don't have a ride there, don't worry, we got you. Uh, there's going to be a sign-up sheet, and there's going to be buses that are going to take us to City Hall right down at Tabor Grind. And finally, we're going to have the altar call. If you see these tables right over here, it's, uh, it was popularized back in the day where Charles Finney uh, would have petitions signed up for people who wanted to abolish slavery. And right now we're bringing it back so we can stop child sex slavery. And as Justin and Riley and Shannon play one last song for us, we, we invite you to come down, sign up with the, with the petition, and join in this fight. And so uh, my Warner Pacific Knights, our kingdom needs us as cheesy and as corny as that just sounded, it's true. <laughs> we have the ability to do and sacrifice so much for the people we care about, and we need to start making that extra step. And it just takes one night to make that step. But luckily for us, we have a whole room full of them. So right now, our class wants to read this petition for you. It's uh, the petition to the mayor and the Portland City Commissioners. Dear Mr. Mayor, Mayor Hales and the Portland City Commissioners, we are a class of college freshmen at Warner Pacific College through our first year learning community class called Faith, Justice, in Portland. We have been learning about this issue of commercialized sexual exploitation of children in Portland. Throughout our studies, we have come to see what the child sex trafficking industry really is, modern-day human slavery. Girls and boys have been taken against their wills and are being forced to commit horrible sexual acts to strange and dangerous people. We cannot let this horrible atrocity continue within our great city, and these violent children need our help. We must not turn a blind eye to the needs of these children who have been taken advantage of. The funding, funding for these vital resources is to make a drastic impact on some, some of the most marginalized persons in our community. If, if girls had help with recovery and healing from sexual assault, violence, and manipulation, they, they can live better lives, can live better lives and are less likely to return to the streets. If survivors have beds to return to, just a small place to call home and sleep safely, they can get back on their feet in a healthy environment. 
and it wouldn't teach my own girls about the dangers of these relationships and the difficulties of the world. We can kill the problem at the root. The average age of female victim is 12 to 14, and the average age of male or transgender victim is 11 to 13. We need to warn and give kids proper and full person education when they are in school. Our class, along with the Oregon Pacific College community, urges you to approve commissioners to put the entire budget on the class floor. Funding the Sexual Assault Resource Center and Life Rights Northwest and new options for women's program to expand the case management and cultural issues to the Pacific and Trans Women's Project in 2018 to 25. Funding for the Pacific and Trans Women's Project in 2018 to 25 at the GSP's program in the House. Currently, if a survivor leaves the program and later wants to return, they, they can't if they are over 18. Creating a Willow Strengths Pilot Program and extending the Willow Strengths Program around the staff of the Portland Police Bureau, providing the middle school students to teach them appropriate relationship behaviors and what to do if they have a relationship with violence and their trafficking. Respectfully, the Winter Pacific College Faith and Justice in Portland are front and class. We have, we, have, we have one more song to sing for you today. And despite being a... Michelle wants Hello. Um, as you sing, we're allowed to come up and sign the petition, correct? Yes. Um, so I know it's our, it's our time and some of you will have to leave to go to class. But before you leave, if you would rally to this cause and as they sing this song, find your way to a table, any table, grab a pen and... Uh, and add your name to the petition. All right? Cool. All right. And we have one more song. And the lyrics will be up on the screen, so feel free to sing along. This one's actually happier than the last one. <laughs> Your presence brings new life among the darkness. The evils of this world can do no harm. You work in I see your colors above on the skylines, blue in the daytime and red in the evening. You paint the portrait for all that is righteous, bringing our hope to the world below heaven. Above on the skylines, blue in the daytime. 
consignment read in the evening. You paint the portrait of all that is righteous, giving out hope to a world below heaven. Oh, you.